So, um, I'm Melissa Giroux, I'm a co-founder of Embrace Race. And I'm Andrew Grant Thomas, he, him, also co-founder. Uh, she, her. And we, uh, Embrace Race is a community of support for parents, caregivers, educators, others um, who want to raise and mentor kids who are um, thoughtful, informed, and brave about race. Uh, we are also life partners, a couple. Some kids upstairs could interrupt us, um, but likely not tonight. They seem kind of settled in. Um, it feels really fitting that tonight we're where this webinar is about anti-bias education in the early years. And it seems really fitting to be talking about bias, of course, because uh, bias is a very serious matter um, and bias can kill. And we know that on the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd today. So we're really excited to be having this important conversation. Um, we want to, Andrew's gonna introduce uh, the filmmakers who are giants themselves in um, anti-bias and early ed. We're excited to have them on. And they're going to introduce, um, he's going to introduce them, they're going to introduce the film, and then we're going to watch the film, which is, runs a little under 50 minutes. Um, and then we'll introduce uh, two of the teachers from the film and have John and Debbie back and have a conversation and, and, and do Q&A. Um, so that's how it will look tonight. We're very excited. The film is called Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Action, the Early Years. Andrew, some introductions, please. Yeah, one last thing. Um, again, we'll be having some Q&A. So you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, a chat box and a Q&A box. We encourage you to participate uh, as many of you are now telling us where you're from, which is lovely in the chat. Uh, that chat will get very vibrant. At least that's typically the case and we hope it's the case today. Please do, except if you have questions that you like possibly posed uh, to our guests, please put those in the Q&A because we will not be able to track questions in the chat. Right. Um, and, and, and if you could in the chat write to where it's appropriate panelists and attendees so that everyone can benefit from the resources um, and thoughts that you share. We always read the chat later and, and learn a lot from it. So please do that. At Embrace Race, we are always uh, relying on the experience expertise of others, and that's certainly true tonight. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce uh, two of the, the main, the principals behind this film. Debbie Lee Keenan is a longtime social justice educator, early childhood consultant, lecturer, and author. She has been in the field of early education for over 48 years. She's a former preschool, special education, and elementary school teacher and has been a member of the early childhood faculty at Tufts University, Lesley University, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She's written numerous books, including leading anti-bias early childhood programs with Louise Derman Sparks and John Nimmo. Debbie's a member of a multiracial family and an active grandmother, and now a second time guest on this webinar. Debbie, come on in. We're really delighted to have you. And I also want to introduce uh, her colleague, John Nimmo. John is a professor of early childhood education at Portland State University in Oregon. From 2003 to 2013, he was executive director of the Child Study and Development Center and associate professor of human development and family studies at the University of New Hampshire, where he was recipient of the Social Justice Award and the Excellence Through Diversity Award. His many publications, include leading anti-bias early childhood programs with Louise Derman Sparks and Debbie Lee Keenan. He's also a former early childhood and elementary teacher in his home, in his first home of Australia and now in the US. Welcome to you both. We're really, really glad, We're to, so have glad you. to have you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew and Melissa. We are honored to be here today and to be able to share our film and support the great work of Embrace Race. We are all huge fans. So why did we make this film and what was involved? So we were fortunate to receive a grant from a small nonprofit in Connecticut called the Tyler Rigg Foundation, who was interested in supporting anti-bias initiatives after they saw Louise Derman Sparks in 2017 on a PBS news spot on the evening mm -hmm. news. Louise had created the first film on anti-bias education in 1989 so we thought it may be time for an update. So our film is really a response to the question we often hear, what does anti-bias education look like in the classroom? And the film shifts the focus from uh, talking heads of experts 
onto the voices and actions of teachers who are committed to making equity and diversity a part of their life and their classroom experience. So the film you'll see is a series of classroom vignettes with teachers responding to children's questions and comments about differences, and then also reflecting on their own identity, context, and practice. One of the messages of the film is that there's not one way to do anti-bias education. It is based on the framework of the four anti-bias goals of identity, diversity, justice, and action. And this approach involves critical thinking and a deep understanding of the complexity of the issues and of your context, your community, the children, the families, the teachers, the colleagues that you work with. Another message in the film is that anti-bias education is possible and doable in all kinds of settings. We wanted to show, to show teachers who are not perfect, but rather comfortable taking risks, willing to make mistakes, being vulnerable, and sharing who they are. There are no scripts or actors in the film. These are real teachers in real classrooms. But of course, there was preparation. John and I met with the teachers before the actual filming for around three months. I attended bi-weekly team meetings where we would talk about the anti-bias moments that were happening in their classroom, how the teachers were responding, how they integrated this approach in their, to, into their curriculum, and of course, how they included families. The coaching and professional development before the actual filming was also about creating, uh, building trust between the teachers, the directors, the sites. We really feel this project was a very collaborative endeavor uh, between us, the producers, the teachers, the, the directors, the sites, and of course, our wonderful filmmaker, Feliz F.A. McKinney of Brave Sprouts, which is based here in Seattle. So while the film was made with educators in mind, we really are finding that anyone who is interested in social justice work will find it very useful and particularly families. So most important, we see this film as a provocation to generate a dialogue on how to make this anti-bias education a part of your practice and a part of your life. And we hope you'll see it as a catalyst for change. John, do you want yeah. to talk a bit? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much to Embrace Race and um, Andrew and Melissa and also our wonderful interpreters today. Thank you for being here and welcome. I see over a thousand people. So um, that's just really exciting and I can feel my heart beating right now. Um, you know, this film uh, is talk, talks about anti-bias education. And we began with a view, an image of young children that they are seeking to make sense of what they see around them. They're seeking to make sense of diversity. They're seeking to make sense of themselves, their identities. And they're also trying to make sense of the biases and discrimination that they see around them. You know, we believe that uh, young children absorb and internalize, internalize biases that reflect uh, the social and individual prejudice and discriminations that exist in our society. And so we um, come from a, a belief that young children are very empathic, empathetic, uh, they have a deep sense of fairness and they understand unfairness. Uh, we also believe that they have agency, that they are uh, can, they are actively trying to make sense of things and they can act uh, when they see unfairness. So this is sort of a grounding for this approach we call anti-bias education. We also believe very strongly in an active and strong view of teachers of young children um, and families of young children that um, you are making decisions at every moment in the day as part of uh, uh, addressing bias recognizing bias and also giving children the tools to work against bias. So we see in this film, we tried to view the teachers as the decision makers, the experts in their own classrooms. And that um, we believe strongly that doing nothing when it comes to bias is always doing something. So you always have to do something. You can't just do nothing. Um, Anti-bias education, I think is a very optimistic approach. It, it brings hope and it really, it, permeates everything you do in an early childhood setting 
Uh, it's not a set curriculum. It's not a plan, although you'll see many strategies in the film, um, but it, it really depends and it's going to be different depending on your particular setting, your families, the children and your community, the place you're in and the social identities of the people who are in there. Uh, so we hope that you can take what you see in the film, like as Debbie says, as a provocation, and then to look at and reflect on your own particular uh, settings of, of children, families, and communities. Uh, in the anti-bias education you'll see in this film, we've structured around the four goals. The first one being identity. In other words, what's being reflected back to me as a child or an adult about who I am? How do I feel good about who I am? And I, I think of embrace race. How do I embrace who I am uh, in the world in terms of the group identities that I belong to? and the families I belong to. So one is this mirror coming back to you. The second goal is we, what we call uh, diversity, and that is the windows out to um, all the other people in this world. How do I, um, am I encouraged as a young child to be curious about diversity, to love diversity, to want to understand diversity, and to, uh, and to realize that um, there's power in interacting with folks who are different from who I am, whether it's by ability or gender expression or race or language and so forth. The third one is justice, and that is um, the belief that young children can be given tools to understand bias, um, which of course is connected to systemic uh, racism and oppression, that they can be given the tools, whether it's identifying a stereotype or understanding when something is unfair, um, they, they can get these tools. And then the fourth one is action or activism, being able to do something with those tools, be able to identify and think about how can I um, change things in my world to have that hopeful view um, of uh, the possibility of change. You know, and we, we see these things as uh, an important um, kind of framework for young children. I think another thing uh, before we start the film that I think is really important is that uh, in this film, which we called Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education and Practice, we see teachers who are aware of who they are, what their social identities, that when they walk into the classroom, they're bringing uh, who they are, whether that's their race, their language, their religion, and that you have to be very intentional about understanding that history and heritage and how it relates to what you're doing in terms of the children in your classroom, the families you're working with. And that um, that then prepares you to engage in, to not only observe and see the questions children are asking through their behavior or through their words, but to have the courage to be able to engage in that conversation and even to provoke that conversation at times. And then the last thing I think I would say is that um, Debbie and I recognize that the teachers in this film, uh, we, we think they're brave and they're courageous. Not only did they have you know, filmmakers and us in their classrooms uh, uh, recording their actions as they happened. This was not a scripted um, or a, uh, this is not a film in the sense of a, a scripted film or something. These teachers were not only able to do that, but I think you'll see in their reflections, a great deal of honesty about the complexity of the work and their willingness to be vulnerable. And I think that that's so critical to this work that you have to step up and you have to be able to take a risk and to know that you're going to make mistakes. There's no way to, to do this perfectly. Um, so we, we hope that um, you will see this optimistic view. Um, and, I, and I think we both believe that this is a very heart-centered film. Um, and that it and that it will speak to you and your work in the classroom or with your families. Great, thank you so much, both. Um, I think we're ready to see the film. We'll yeah, see I'm you ready. on the other side.
That was amazing. That was remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. Um, please come on back. You know, one of the uh, really wonderful things about this film and, um, you know, to our two teachers and whom I'll introduce in just a moment to John and Debbie, I hope you saw all the love, all the appreciation, uh, you know, <laughs> heartfelt and clearly mind felt as well mm -hmm. that people were reflecting. That was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm an absolutely extraordinary film. One of the things that uh, we really love about it, certainly I really love about it, is that, as you said, Debbie, when you're introducing it, uh, you really lift up the voices of educators and children. Mm -hmm. There are, as you say, no talking head experts in this film. Mm -hmm. um, although there are lots of talking head experts who have lots of good things to offer, to be sure, including uh, you. Uh, but wow, amazing. Let me introduce them. Nadia Habonetta lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband and three children. Nadia is a program coordinator and classroom teacher at Pacific Primary Preschool. She has 22 years of experience in early childhood education, teaching young children, training teachers, consulting and facilitating workshops. She's passionate about social justice and proud to have immigrant parents from Lima, Peru. She also is the author of two books, one entitled you Can't Celebrate That, Navigating the Deep Waters of Social Justice Education, and Children's Lively Minds, Schema Theory Made Visible. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you for That's your uh, contribution. And Joyce Jackson, who is a teacher at the Epiphany Early Learning Preschool in Seattle, Washington. Joyce has been working in the early childhood education field for over 30 years. She says, hi, Joyce. She says, our children's first years are their most impressive. Having such an important role in the early education of our future is very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Working with children gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling on the inside, and that's always a good thing. Joyce Jackson has done local presentations, has been a featured teacher in Exchange Magazine. She is a wife, a mother of three, and a grandmother of 12. Um, welcome. Here's where I'd love to start, and maybe I'll start with you, Nadia. Uh, Joyce, at the beginning of the film, uh, you talk about uh, this being a journey, right? A journey for you. And, and that is, that's one of the highlights of the film for you and for others. We see the journey, uh, uh, you know, the learning journey, uh, an experiential journey that teachers are having. You know, Nadia, you too refer later in the film to uh, Brian, right, being sort of your partner in thinking through some of the challenges you face and how to meet different circumstances. We'd love to hear, you know, for all of us, but especially for the educators who are watching and listening and wondering how might I, you know, are there some milestones, are there some particular suggestions you would make that might help guide the journeys that they want to make as anti-bias educators? And of course, underlining that Debbie explained at the beginning that you all worked together for a few months before making the film as well. And Nadia, can we start with you? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I've been really reflecting a lot about my, my journey as a social justice leader in the field of early childhood, but also in my life as just a human, as a mom, as a daughter, as, you know, all the different roles that I have. And I feel like without even knowing it, I've been on, on this anti-bias social justice journey my, my whole life. My parents, as I mentioned in the film, um, came from Lima, Peru over 55 years ago. And they specifically chose this city, San Francisco, California, because they had some friends and family who had moved here and told them this is such a diverse city with so many opportunities for education, for raising a family, for jobs. So growing up here in San Francisco, and I'm still here today, I really got to um, grow up really having so much family pride, really being proud of my roots, being proud of my culture, and going to a school that was predominantly white, as I mentioned in the film. It really, about maybe fifth grade, I really started to notice, you know, I'm different. I don't feel like I fit in. I started to think, you know, I wish I was white. I want blonde hair. I want to look like my best friends. I want to have homes like my best friends do and eat those foods. And I would tell my dad, you know, pick me up a little further after school today, okay? When I open the door, don't speak Spanish to me, okay? Mm -hmm. So it took me up until eighth grade where I became a real advocate without even knowing it and really talking to my parents about, I wanna go to a school that's different. 
I want to go to a school where I can see people that look like me, that talk like us, that eat food like us. And I want to know a lot more about people who are different than us too. And here are some of the anti-bias goals. And I'm you know, 13, 14 years old. And we were able to find a high school that, that was like that. And I really got that family pride back, that confidence. And moving forward to finding Pacific Primary, I was a mom, I had a three-year-old, I was looking for just something new, and I read their mission statement and how much it talked about their commitment to social justice, to having a diverse community, and I knew it was a place I wanted to be as a teacher, but also as a parent, and starting at that time, about 12 years ago, I really began to dig deeper into myself, who am I, what is my role as a person of color, as a Latina, how do I bring my true self to this community, and really going to lots of, and you know, I was going to say webinars, it wasn't webinars back then, <laughs> it was actually in-person workshops, doing lots of reading, and really collaborating with Brian, and using a reflective lens, and really studying the anti-bias schools, and what that looked like in our classrooms, what that looked like in the younger classrooms. And I'm still on this journey. I don't consider myself an expert at all, but I consider myself learning something new every day, learning along with the children, learning along with my colleagues, learning along with all the families and learning with my own family, my children. I have a 15 year old, an 11 year old and a one year old. So I'm just constantly learning something new. and. Um, something that I feel like I do want to share with everyone watching is that there isn't one way to do this. There's just so many ways to do this work and be really committed to social justice. And, you know, it could be scary sometimes, but don't be, you know, don't be scared away by all the, all the experts out there who are giving us advice on how to do this work. You know you best, you know your context best, you know your kids best, whether it's in your classroom, whether it's your own children. Um, there's just so many ways to do this work and we're all in this together working towards the same goals. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Joyce. Hi. Hi. Oh, I would say, uh, echo what, um, Nadia said about it being a lifelong journey um, and being born, you know, I'm a person of color. So thinking back to uh, way back elementary school, having all white teachers in the classroom. Um, but I knew when I was in kindergarten that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, when I went to college, uh, one of I came in class one night and there was just like all the desks were pulled back and there were just magazine pictures all over the floor and the teacher said find yourself in one of these magazines find something that relates to you and I couldn't um they were all non-black people white people mostly and so I think at that moment, I mean, which, you know, shaking my head that this is a shame. Um, it pushed me further to think about um, just inclusiveness, um, you know, being in, a, being in a classroom that is welcoming. Um, it's a set you know, accepting of diversities, um, embracing differences, appreciating, respecting. Um, and now, you know, that I, I have my own kids and I do consider the kids in my classroom, my kids eight hours a day, every day. Um, but it's like, I feel like we have to give them the tools now. Um, give them words, we're role modeling because they are the ones that are gonna take over. And right now it's, I just feel like it's, it's the job of the teachers, you know, all the educators, the parents, we gotta equip our kids with these tools that they need to make these changes in the future um, and keep letting them know that, yeah, one day this is gonna be, you know, it, it's not fair now, but you're gonna have the right 
and you're going to have the power to make it right. Mm -hmm. um, and being a teacher in the school that I work in is not really, it's less, it's just, it's not really diverse. Um, but it's so, you know, our school is so focused on the anti-bias goals and bringing these goals in raising children that I do feel like we are empowering these kids with the tools that they need to carry on in the future. Um, and just as much as um, I feel like, um, like just as much as we have to guide the white children in ways to use their privilege and then you know, our children of color that, yeah, you're worthy also, and you have the same power. Right, right, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's, I mean, that's so real, right? That our schools are still, and that we certainly got a lot of questions about that as well, that so many schools are still pretty homogenous, right? I mean, that's kind of more likely than not, right? So it's a real problem. And I wondered, um, Joyce, to follow up with you, a bit on that, um, you talked about in the, there was a, one of the teachers, Veronica, um, said that being a teacher of color is often just in and of itself walking into a classroom, a provocation, right? And yes. you said, and you said um, talked about how every year it happens, they're fascinated with my hair, right? Um, so, <laughs> so I wondered about both of you, how, um, how that's been true, that you're both, you're, you're embracing and carrying yourself and your identities in the room, mm -hmm. but how does that, how is that, has that been a provocation in the classroom in other ways than the ones that you mentioned? It, you know, being a teacher of color and there's me in the classroom with, you know, 15, 16 little white kids, um, the questions that they have, they just, they bring so many deep conversations. Um, they wanna know about me, just like I wanna know about them. Um, we have our family pictures in the classroom. So even the teachers bring their, you know, and they wanna know about my family. And it's like, I learn something from them every single day, which my grandma always said when we were little, you gotta learn something new every day. Um, these kids, it's just, their curiosity they want to know and they need to know mm -hmm. and I do want them to know about you know me my culture we talk about um like some kids talk about God it's like religion is just a topic that we talk about we talk about um they were talking about getting new crayons and one little girl was saying well sometimes if you don't have money then you just can't get new crayons and I was like well yeah I said, I know about that. I said, because sometimes when I was little, you know, and I broke my toys and I couldn't get another toy. And then they're like, why? You know, why couldn't you? If I break something, I can just go get another one. My mom and dad can just buy me another one. But, you know, we talk, that just brings up the conversations of, oh, well, everybody can't do that. Right. That's such a gift to them to have some difference, right? And, and a person of authority as well. Um, Nadia, what about you? I've been thinking about how um, being in a diverse community with um, diverse families, diverse teachers, really working together in a meaningful and genuine way is such a huge piece of us um, being in an anti-racist community and also me being able to feel comfortable in bringing my full true self to the classroom, to my school every day, really opens up so many conversations that the children know they're in a in a safe space. They know they're in a brave space where they can ask me questions about me, about my family. They can share about themselves. They're um, really brave and just pointing out things that they might not agree with, whether we're reading a book or it's something that I share or a friend shares and having these discussions where we're being respectful to each other, we're listening to, the, to each other. We can say it's okay to have different ideas. People can do things differently, but it's really, you know, especially this year with COVID, we have a smaller group size. We have 10 children in our classroom. So I've just noticed just these deep conversations that we're having. Um, just this week, I read a book about um, B 
being different and being the same. And I didn't realize the book was written in 1991. I saw the title and I thought, well, this is going to be a conversation starter. And the real children just, again, really feeling safe and brave and saying, Nadia, but you know, that's not true. There's more ways to be than just boy and a girl. What do you think? And us having this, again, this just open conversation about ways that you can be. And it's just been such a special year. And I'm um, going to be really sad when these kids go to kindergarten. <laughs> now, I want to stay with you. And I want to ask a question about, right, uh, you're wondering whether or not to, um, how to respond to a child who mentioned George Floyd and his murder. And, uh, and I want to ask uh, sort of the big question is about families, how you engage families, because you mentioned doing that. I wonder if you give us a little more information. Before that, though, I wanted to ask what may be a smaller thing, but may not be a smaller thing that's related, which mm -hmm. is there was a point uh, when you ask, do the children want to march? And I noticed, which I hadn't noticed before, that right there's a little tally mm -hmm. of yes, no. And there are maybe seven or eight yeses when we see it, and there's one no. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, did you how did you how did you respond with respect to that child or any children who said no? Yeah. Well, just to give you a little background, I'm not sure how it emerged, but the children were really interested in these tally tallying and surveys that school year. So um, we had all kinds of surveys all over the classroom. Do you like oranges or do you like apples? <laughs> and then as we started learning more about being social justice leaders in our community, they'd be telling us like, well, who, who do you like better, police officers or firefighters? And then there was this question that the children asked, well, let's ask everybody if they want to have a march and we'll have a vote. So this child went around and asked everybody. And the one child who didn't want to have a march had said, well, that she was shy and didn't want people looking at her and was, you know, just felt really shy about it. And that's why she didn't want to go. So we helped her in brainstorming ways. Well, we really want to include you. We all really want to do this. How can we help you? And the agreement we made was that she would hold my hand and we would do it together. And I would help her hold her sign. So um, next thing you know, she didn't want to hold my hand anymore. She was, she was just there holding her sign up high and proud. So um, that's what that, that was about. Um, in regards to your other questions, I still struggle every day um, in what I should tell children, how far I should go, what I shouldn't tell them, how I support them in thinking about the unfairness in our world today, about racism. I don't want to cause harm. I don't want to scare them, particularly with the violence piece. Um, I wish there was like just one answer and I'm constantly like watching webinars and reading like I want to know what is what is the answer for for two-year-olds for three-year-olds for four-year-olds for five-year-olds you know um and there there isn't there you know there's so many perspectives there's so many um different contexts and again just us knowing ourselves knowing our families that we're working with knowing the children that are in our care. And even in that small group, there might be one child whose family is talking about what happened to George Floyd. Um, and then the you know the kid right here, you know, they're not. So how do I, as a teacher in this classroom with these 22 children meet the needs of all 22 of them? Um, and it's tricky, it's really hard and tricky work. So um, when this happened, I, emailed all the families with telling them what had happened to that day, how I responded, and acknowledging that a lot of them may not be ready to have this conversation with their children. So I gave them some resources that they can look at. I helped with giving them some sentences that they could use, and I made myself very available. Our director, Bellan made herself available to please let us know if they want to have a phone conversation, a Zoom call. Again, this is all during COVID. Um, several parents met me at the window of, of our school and six feet away, you know, we talked through the window and gave them some tips on how they can approach us at home that evening. And throughout the rest of the summer, really collaborated with talking to them about how the conversations were going at home, what their children were saying, and they wanted to help, they wanted to participate. So, you know, it, there was a lot of back and forth of things you can do at home, things that we were doing at school, sharing photos, reaching out to, to other family members for 
their perspectives and helping children and thinking through this. And also there was parents who didn't know what to do. You know, one family came to me and said, you know, my child said that they don't, they don't want to make another sign tomorrow. And I, I'm not sure why, and I don't know how to respond. Am, am I doing enough? Are we not talking about this enough? So setting up a Zoom call with supporting them and thinking about how to best support their child. But so it's, again, it's tricky work, but it's all very important work. And it was just such a special summer and all of us collaborating as a community together to empower the children to really have this sense of being powerful and acting together against this um, unfair thing that happened. Thank you so much, Nadia. You know, um, Debbie, I'm reminded of when you were uh, a guest with us and we asked the, uh, it was mostly an educator audience, and we asked them in the chat, you know, what were some of the obstacles that they had you know, insofar as they wanted to do anti-bias work, what were some of the obstacles they had? And I would say 90 something percent of them basically pointed to other adults, right? Mm -hmm. Very often parents, sometimes other teachers, administrators. You know, Joyce, I want to come to you and say, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, you're able, you know, that you try to engage mm -hmm. the family members uh, in any of the work, the anti-bias work you do, what can you tell us about that experience what works, what doesn't work, whatever you may think worth highlighting here. I would say um, it is very important to have our families involved in the classroom. Um, we've invited parents, well, pre-COVID, <laughs> into our classrooms uh, to share their cultures. Um, some parents like to come share, you know, different recipes from their cultures. Um, we've had parents come talk about the different religions and it's when, when the kids notice, like they'll look at each other's family pictures or they'll notice something like in the background of one of the pictures, you know, like, what is that? And then when the kids can tell each other, like, oh, in my family, we celebrate, you know, this or that. And then, it make, it's, it's an interest of all of them. And this is something that we encourage, um, finding out about each other's differences, respecting each other's differences. And our parents are always on board to come in the classroom and share. Um, we've had this currently and what, 2020, and then even further back than that, that we've had parents and kids come in, the kids will come in and tell us about different protests that they went to with their parents, different marches. Um, I mean, almost all of them know about Martin Luther King. Um, we're in Seattle and it's, I don't, it's, it seems like, which is a good thing, which is, and I appreciate parents when they involve their kids in the protests and it's like, this is the way they're getting their information. You know, it's hands-on um, and we do encourage that. And then when they come back to school, it's like we have all these conversations about, oh, like we with George Floyd, um, that how sometimes the word that just describes it in a way that they can understand it is just mean. Some people are mean and creating, you know, the space where these kids can have empathy and they can, you know, we can just openly discuss all these different things with them. I mean, it's, it's always a plus. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, I wonder, this is, I just can't help thinking and just hearing about um, communicating with the parents and just even all the Zoom calls around this Ooh. past year. Um, just thinking about how um, how much better prepared you know these kids are going to be than um, their parents. You know, it's a lot of support that pa we parents and teachers need right now to do this work that wasn't done. You know, for many Definitely. of our kids. So um, yeah, so we're grateful for the work you're you're doing. Um, we're going to go to questions because there are so many questions, um, and one of them that came up a lot in the uh, registration and that is probably coming up in the chat is about um, the difficulty of um, 
teaching about anti-bias work uh, in regards to race in particular when you have a homogenous classroom. So when you have uh, a teacher and kids that are all of the same race or almost or majority, right? Um, and oftentimes that's asked about white classrooms in particular. And I know um, we have uh, Louise DeMar Sparks on. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Shout out, and, um, and that she wrote that fabulous book that we uh, recommend a lot with um, Patricia Ramsey who lives in our area. And we know uh, what if all the children are white. And, and I, I do think that um, what you said, Joyce, really underlines the way in, in even a um, fairly, a, classroom where there are a lot of white kids, of course, you're the provocation, but um, there's also a lot of differences that you're seeing and that they're sharing. So um, they're understanding that um, they're understanding, they're, they're differentiating in all these ways that are really important, I think, and that um, uh, Louise DeMar Sparks and Pat Ramsey talk about in that book, the importance of doing that. Uh, but I wonder, um, Debbie and John, if you could speak a bit about what what does the teacher in the homogenous classroom do, or um, say the white teacher in the homogenous classroom? Can I can I add a little thing? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. That's because I was thinking very much along. I mean, one of the remarkable things about this film, it seems to me, is that you really do treat differences along many dimensions seriously, mm -hmm. right? So you know, Melissa and I were on a um, uh, the school that our children went to when they were much younger, we were in the diversity committee for three years. Mm -hmm. And even though that diversity committee, which right, presumably applies to many things, right, race and gender and gender expression, all sorts of things, mm -hmm. it was commonly, it was our common experience that uh, we came back to race again and again and again, right? Not necessarily in application in practice, but at least in talking about it, race tended to obliterate right, all the other differences and the, the kind of attention it got. So, but not in this film, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing. So if, if you want to pick up on, on that at all. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that both of us share um, a belief that race and racism is pretty central to the United States and intersecting with all these other identities. But I think, um, some folks who ask, ask, well, what's the difference between an anti being anti-racist and anti-racist anti teaching and anti-bias? And I think it is partly because we're working with very young children is considering all of those identities that they're, they're constructing and that they're constructing them together. You know, we don't want to sort of pass it out. Um, and we tried in the film to show that, um, that they're constructing those, those identities uh, whether it's gender expression, they're trying to understand religion, they're trying to understand language, um, as they begin to encounter a society which is, to me, structured around white supremacy. So, you know, that as an adult, we, we begin to see how critical um, race and racism is in this country. In terms of this question about um, all white, you know, or, uh, programs where the teachers or the, the, the families are primarily white, I think, you know, to me, first, we believe anti-bias education is for those settings as much as any other setting, you know, that's the first thing. The second thing is that thinking about uh, um, all the identities, that there's going to be diversity in any program, whether it's across social class or um, family structure or language, um, uh, gender expression, there is going to be that diversity there. So I, I don't think we want to think about any place as, you know, somehow just mono, monocultural. I think the other thing is for me, thinking as a white teacher myself, um, is that to me, it's not, it's not a surprise. I think it's a symptom of um, systemic oppression and white supremacy that white folks don't like to talk about <laughs> or have been socialized not to talk about their identities in terms of race. And so I think that's the first thing for me is that if you're in that center, you have to get comfortable with talking about that part of yourself um, with, with children and with colleagues and, and practicing that. And I think part of that is both recognizing uh, being able to find ways to talk to four-year-olds about privilege and those kinds of uh, things, whether it's for social class or race, and also being able to be very clear about um, the heroes and, and models that you have who may be both BIPOC and also white folks. I mean, Louise Dermot-Sparks is on, 
is is in the uh, audience here somewhere. And you know, for me, and I know for Debbie, she's a model. She's an important model in my growth over the last thirty years. Um, and there are other folks who I turn to as models of a an anti racist view of being white. So I think that's a couple of the things you can do. The other thing that I always find is if you dig below, if you go be, be beyond your just classroom of children and families and make connections with communities, make connections with the neighborhood, uh, talk to families about their um, extended family or friends, you begin to see you can build true and authentic relationships with folks who are going to reflect diversity around race. And I saw that in New Hampshire, uh, which is not exactly known for its um, racial diversity. And it wasn't that difficult to begin to create meaningful relationships with folks who broke that sense that everyone was white, which is what you know the kids were experiencing. Mm -hmm. Debbie, yeah. The only thing I, I'll add to that was also that uh, particularly those four goals of identity, diversity, justice, and action, they're for all children. There's often some misconceptions about them. Well, these are the kind of goals we have to work with these kind of kids, and these are the kind we work with others. Everyone needs to work on all of those. Um, and uh, as John mentioned, though, the intersectionality of all of these different identities with race being a core one. Um, is, is key. I often think of also groups when they say, well, we don't see any diversity here. You know, we, we talk about the diversity being the relationship between us. It's not that you're diverse and I'm not diverse. Or, uh, or, and um, also I think of abilities as another good way to start when people look at a predominant, looks like oh, we have a whole white community. I, I think of, you know, abilities. We all have things that we're good at. We all have things that are hard for us, right? That's another way to start to think about that. And of course, some of the strategies in the film, I think, apply to all different kinds of settings, right? They're using those persona dolls, using literature. Um, you know, which Nadia brings up, you know, mirrors and windows, that whole concept, I think, um, is another way to how do I get started if I'm predominantly in a homogeneous community. And it's great you mentioned that the, of course, the film is free to watch on your website and there's just amazing resources on your website. Um, and I, I encourage everybody to, you know, we'll send you all the links to all of that, but to seek out that material and there'll be links to books like What If All the Kids Are White, if you just dig very deeply. We have about eight minutes left and want to give each of you a last word if you'd like to have it. So let me ask just one more question. Uh, which you know a lot of people are asking. Actually, there's a analogous question on the parent side, but I'm a, which is about pushback from parents. But I'm going to flip it around a little bit and talk about administrators. You know, in our experience, we don't know. We certainly don't personally know a, many examples of schools that truly give institutional support to this kind of work. Right? What's much more common is this teacher here and that teacher there, and you hope your kid gets that right teacher. Mm -hmm because that teacher is trying to do amazing work really against the odds and without a whole lot of support, which by the way, also makes that teacher more as it were vulnerable to right, those parents who might come in uh, and, and push yeah. back hard. But yeah. there are, uh, we do have some questions possibly from administrators who are asking, okay, but if I do want, I want to support, I just don't know how. So what are some things that administrators can do to support the efforts of teachers trying to do this work? First thing I think about, of course, is creating that culture, having the vision, having the mission. That's the role of the leader, that this equity work is important. It's a part of everything we do. It's going to be part of our staff meetings. It's going to be part of our budget. It's going to be part of um, our mission statements, a part of how we work with families, right? So they, you have to lead and have that vision. On the other hand, you don't just want it top down. We talk a lot about it needs to bubble up. So you need both, when we say leaders, you have the teacher leaders, right? You have the family leaders. You wanna create this community of people who have a common vision. It can be done through an equity, uh, equity team. You know, There are a lot of different specific strategies for doing it that way. But I think it's that creating the culture, making it a part of everything that you're doing um, and, Feeling, sharing your own commitment to that, being willing to say, I don't know everything, but I know this is important. It's our ethical, it's part of our ethical responsibility as teachers, as early childhood professionals, 
right? So this is why we're doing it. And we're going to do this together and work through this together. And knowing that even if, if I don't know everything, if there are mistakes and conflicts and we fall down, we get up, that, that, that's the process of doing this work. So, yeah. so John, please. Uh, the, the other thing I was thinking of with the administrators and you know, Debbie and Louise and I wrote a book leading anti-bias early childhood programs because we could see teachers struggling. You know, there's a lot of material about there what to do in the classroom, but then that becomes very limited without the support of administrators. And I'd say one of the things that was most important to me as an administrator was having the teachers back to be there uh, to engage with some of the difficult conversations uh, uh, that might happen with parents who are uh, resistant to or have problems with being, supporting them, um, allowing them to do their work. Um, and also, I think, as Debbie said, this idea of facilitated leadership, of really listening to what teachers need. And I think budgets are powerful, even if you don't have a big budget. I, I, I always looked at my budget in terms of being an equity tool and thinking about what, what possibility was there for shifting something towards an equity priority, given that you're always prioritizing, prioritizing as, a, as, a, as a leader, administrator. Fabulous. Um, thank you so much. Again, I want to give each of you a minute. Uh, that I know that's not a lot of time, but to share, to reflect on anything you haven't been able to respond to or to share anything you want to uh, to leave us Maybe with the rewards of this work. I know there are a lot of challenges. Uh, so uh, Joyce, can I start with you? Yes, sir. I feel like, and I wish, and I hope that an, an anti-bias education could be given to all educators. Um, I mean, thinking back to when I was a child and in, I wish, and I wish I could have put my kids in a school where the anti-bias goals are at the top of the list. Um, this is something that we, it, it's a part of who I am. It's a part of who I want the kids in my classroom to be. It's, it's a, just a daily journey and it's a continuous journey and it's necessary. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you so much, Nadia. I was thinking about the, the film and how you all see just a glimpse of each of our classrooms and the work that we're doing. And the reason I do this work is not to say, here's how to do it and here, you know, follow my, my lead and you should do it exactly the same. But my goal is that you will all be inspired in how to do it in your way and also to really see how powerful children are, listen to them, follow, follow their lead, learn along with them. And it's just really meaningful, important work. Thank you. I think it's fair to say that you and Joyce and your colleagues have inspired a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And we will clearly continue to do that. Thank you so yeah, much, not least you. us. John, can I come to you? Yeah, it's it's always so delightful to to be on these uh, panels with teachers, wonderful educators like Nadia and Joyce, and um, we, we've learned so much through this process. What I was thinking at the beginning, I said something about anti-bias education being optimistic, and I got that from Louise's book. And I think that um, it's one it's one antidote, one tool we have uh, anti-bias education to uh, address oppression and racism. And I, it's not the only thing, adults have a lot of work to do with other adults. It's not all on the, the backs of children, just change um, this society. Right. Uh, but I think that anti-bias education is a kind of act of hope and a belief in the capacity of children. And I think about when I'm, uh, someone who's been, whose writing has been important to me, Paulo Freire from Brazil, he, he had a, an expression uh, that he invented in um, Portuguese that, that basically meant hope in the present. And I think children are hope in the present. We, we don't think about futures, we think about now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Debbie. And uh, I'll say 
about leaning into discomfort and conflict. I, I like to say that, you know, my professionally, I know that, that we, I like to use the word productive disequilibrium, right? We learn through this tension when there's conflict, because that means growth. But I also know that my uh, uh, cultural background, being Chinese American, often taught me that I had to be a peacemaker, live in harmony, don't, don't rock the boat. So learning to feel, I, I guess my last thoughts is about leaning into com, uh, conflict and feeling comfortable with it and taking that step, be brave. And, but one step at a time, we can do it. Beautiful. Right, now you take us out, Liz? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, John, if you could just tell us, or Debbie, just tell us the name of the website where folks can see the film again. Uh, antibiasleadersece.com. We'll make sure that, yes, that uh, Embrace Race has that link. And also the guidebook, which a lot of people are asking, really has um, a lot of questions and prompts and all the resources. Which book do I get this? They're all listed in their uh, websites. And if you want to use the film as a professional development tool, we want you to, there are actually some of the questions and prompts you can use as a tool with your communities, with your families, um, and it's free. We want we want to get it out there. Yeah, and we're we're also making available. Um, you can get a DVD and pack it with the guidebook if you like to have it in your hands. Uh, that'll be available in June, and we're just sort of trying to do that close to cost. Yeah, we really appreciate all of the resources and work you've put in, and we're so honored to have you all on um, talking race and kids with embrace race and to have everyone who's, who's participating. Awesome. So thank you thank so much. You. More to come, we hope. Nadia and Joyce, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you for inviting us. It was an honor. Thank to our interpreters and to Chris yeah. behind the scenes. Behind the thank scenes, you, everyone. Take